articles, papers that really influenced me on this issue is an opening to a very famous tafsir of the Quran in Urdu. It's called the Dabur al by the late Amin Ahsan Islahi rahmahullah. And Amin Ahsan Islahi, before he wrote the Dabur al-Qur'an, he wrote us a booklet called Mabadiya to the Dabur al-Qur'an. Prerequisites to reflecting on the Qur'an. Whenever you study a subject, there are what? Prerequisites. If you're going to go into Accounting 201, you better have taken one already. Accounting 101. If you're going to go and read 4th grade English, you better already know 3rd grade English. There are prerequisites. And he very eloquently argues that in the study or appreciating the Qur'an, there are two sets, two groups of prerequisites. On the one hand, you have academic prerequisites. And on the other hand, you have psychological prerequisites. Um, see if you remember. What kinds of prerequisites are there? Yes. Academic and psychological. He, he separates the two. He separates the two. He says, let me tell you about the academic prerequisites. The Arabic language is an academic prerequisite. Knowing the context of revelation is an academic prerequisite. Understanding the traditional tafasir, what, what our scholars have said in the past about these ayat, the linguistic analysis, the, the shari'i ahkam, the rulings that have been derived from it, all of that literature and scholarship and all of these things, they boil down to academic prerequisite. You can study those things and become a scholar of the Qur'an and not just you, a non-Muslim can do that too. A non-Muslim can fulfill the academic prerequisites and become a top-notch scholar of the Qur'an. As a matter of fact, about 12 years ago, I was in Chicago listening to a speech by a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim was invited to, I still remember, the Foundation Masjid in Chicago, a professor of Islamic studies from Hartford Se Se uh, Seminary in Connecticut. And he came and he spoke for 20 minutes. And when he opened, he said, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَانِ الرَّحِيمِ أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ He recited Surah Al-Ma'ul in perfect tajweed, white guy. Perfect tajweed, not Muslim. And once he was done reciting, off the top of his head, he compared eight different classical tafasir of the first ayah. Ibn Kathir says this, and two centuries before him, Fulan and Fulan said this about this ayah. And he's quoting the original Arabic text. Most of us sitting in the audience are like, Whoa! That guy? And even one uncle from the audience couldn't help himself. Raised his hand, a question on succession. Got him. Why aren't you Muslim? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you say, Oh no, come on. That's why I put him on the spot? But actually, everybody was thinking that. If you know so much, if you know so much, most Muslims, I bet you no Muslim in the audience knew as much as that guy did. It's incredible. He met what kind of prerequisites? <laughs> Academic. But psychological prerequisites are something else. There's something else. And a lot of times when we try to study the Quran and understand the Quran, or try to fulfill the prerequisites of the Quran, like the study of the Arabic language, whether you're studying it for 10 days, or you're studying it for 10 months, or you're studying it for 10 years. You know what happens a lot of times? We keep our attention on the academic prerequisites, and our attention goes away from the psychological prerequisites. They're the ones that get ignored. Because they're not mentioned in the book of Ulum al-Qur'an. They're not mentioned under Ulum al-Tafseer. Here are the attitudes that you have to have. Here is the mindset you must have. All that's mentioned is understand Asbab al-Nuzul, understand Asbahkam al-Tajweed, understand the Tira'at, understand the language, understand this, that all the academic prerequisites are listed. But none of the spiritual, none of the psychological prerequisites are mentioned. They're not listed. I mean, we're not given that essentially. We're just told to have the right intention. But what does that mean? Let's dig deeper a little bit. Let's build the right attitude. So now, I've shared with you when it comes to academics we understand, but when it comes to attitudes, either the Qur'an is there to bless our gatherings, or to protect us, or to be recited when somebody dies, or somebody gets sick. That's our attitude, that's when the Qur'an comes in handy for us. Otherwise it's an ilmi book, it's just a knowledge book. It doesn't really have much to do with my personal life. We have to figure out a reconfiguration. Let's talk about this reconfiguration now. The first thing, all of you know, Quran is a book of fill in the blank. Quran is a book of everybody here knows that. I don't think any Muslim sitting in this audience doesn't know that. Quran is 
सबको क्यों गाइडेंस उसकी एयर भी फट फट गाइडेंस होता द कुरान कॉल्स इट सेल्फ ऑफ इट्स मेनी नेम्स गाइडेंस तारीख किताब उल अवैध भी ही होता इन द हादर कुरान का मैं तरक्की में दाया और आई रिसाइड इन द बिगिनिंग इन द हादर कुरान या दी दिमतीया और इस कुरान गाइडेंस You heard tons of times Quran is guidance Quran is guidance Quran is guidance but I today I want to talk to you about what is that mean just in simple language no academic language no quotations from scholarly works it's in simple language what does that mean when outside of the religious context outside of the religious context when do you use the word guidance have you ever used the word guidance without talking about religion when when you're driving could you offer me some Guidance, some directions. You get guidance from your GPS. You can get guidance from the gas station, right? Where else do you use guidance? High schoolers. And when have you heard the word guidance? Guidance, guidance counselor. When do you go to a guidance counselor? I don't know what to do. I want to be successful. I want to have a really good career. I'm not sure what to do. What college should I apply to? What major should I do? I can't figure it out. Can you help me? Can you give me some guidance? Guidance usually has to do with your future. Number one, you're going to go to college in your future. You're going to see a guidance counselor. You want to end up at some destination in your career. Just like when you're driving, you want to end up at the right destination. You pull over and you ask for some guidance. Now let me ask you this: When you go, you're lost. You're trying to get to the airport. DFW is kind of hard to miss. It's bigger than most cities. But anyway, you're lost. You can't find the airport. You get lost. You pull over at a gas station. You're asking for directions. Now, when you ask for directions and they give it to you, do you need it again? Once you got the directions and you understood them, do you need the directions again? No. Now you go. You don't need to be told over and over again, do you? And if somebody tries to tell you, hey, no, no, take a left here and take a right there, and you say, no, I already know. I already asked. I know I have to take a left here, and I know I have to take a right there. Have you ever driven a car with somebody who wants to give you directions even though the GPS is working, <laughs> and their directions are the exact same thing? You know what? You should take a right here. Now take a left. You ever done that? You know how annoying that gets. And maybe out of respect, you don't say anything, or maybe you just turn and say, "Bro, I know. I'm following her." Because <laughs> usually a lady, right? But the only lady you listen to. So. <laughs> But anyhow, when you know something and you're told again, you say, "Come on, I already know. I don't need this from you. I don't need this guidance from you. I already got it." If you already went, for example, for a financial advisor, a financial guide, a financial counselor, you went to him. He helped you sort out some finances, figure out where you should put your money, what investments you should make, what, you should, what kind of account you should open. You got it all figured out. Then you don't need the same thing over again from him. You don't. And if somebody tries to give it to you, your first response is, "No, thanks. I already know." Your response is, "What? I already know." So it seems to me that in life, guidance has a lot to do with knowledge. In life, <coughs> guidance has a lot to do with what? Knowledge. I went to get guidance at the gas station because I didn't have what? Knowledge. And now that I have knowledge, I don't need to get it again. I have. I have it. In all of life, we assume knowledge to be the same as guidance. Guidance to be the same as knowledge. But when it comes to the Quran, that formula doesn't work. That same formula I just shared with you—that knowledge and guidance can be the same thing—it does not work when we come to Allah's will. That's the first thing we have to understand. Someone who acquired a lot of knowledge of the Quran does that guarantee that they have guidance from the Quran? No. Clearly, there's a difference now between knowledge and guidance. We have to understand this difference. We have to figure this difference out. And by the way, in any other guidance, you don't need it over and over again. But in this guidance, by mandate of Allah Azza wa Jalla, by the most fixed Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, every few hours, you and I stand in front of Allah and say, "Give me guidance." What do we say? What are the words? If guidance was the same as knowledge, you wouldn't have to ask for it over and over again because knowledge is done. You graduated. You know it already. The fact that we have.
have to go ask over and over again must mean there is something else here. Something that I am in the danger of losing between Dhuhr and Asr. And between Asr and Maghrib, I might lose it again. So I have to go back and ask again. And between Maghrib and Isha, I have to ask again. Because I might lose it. Knowledge is not something you lose easily. You, once you know, you know. Two plus two is four. It's four. I know it. It's done. But the guidance of the Quran, the guidance of Allah, you can't keep it. It's not the same as knowledge. So the, the way I want to put this together for you first, is that when it comes to our religion, when it comes to our correct attitudes towards this book, we say that knowledge is a key. It's a key. But it's not the whole thing. It's a part of it. Knowledge is a part of guidance. We need knowledge, but it's not all of it. There's something more. And it's something so pricey and so expensive that even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every single raka'ah that he ever prayed, asked Allah for it. The fact that he had to ask so many times for it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, means it's something extremely valuable and none of us should ever assume that we have it. We shouldn't assume that we have it. Why shouldn't we assume that we have it? Because you don't ask for something you already have. Isn't that the case? <coughs> if I asked you for some water like I asked for Zahim, what does that mean? I'm thirsty. If I ask for water, it means I'm thirsty. When you ask Allah for guidance, what is it supposed to mean? You're thirsty. If I ask for food, it means what? I'm hungry. If we're asking for guidance, it means there is, just like the body runs out of drink, the body runs out of food, and it needs nutrition. Something inside of us is running out. Like every few hours I have to drink, every few hours I'm supposedly running out of something, and I have to go ask for it again. I need it as importantly as I need oxygen and food and drink, and that thing I need is what? Is guidance. And, I, and the only one who can give it to me is Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the only real way to ask Him is to first make wudu, then face Him, and leave everything else aside, and stand in front of Him, leaving the whole world behind you, and then ask Him in this proper way. Because you can't just ask for it. It's not that cheap. You know how you ask your parents for stuff? Can I have five dollars? Nobody asks for five anymore, right? They don't, or your kids don't even know they make money that small. They ask for a twenty at the minimum. But they don't even make eye contact. They're just sitting on their phone. Hey dad, can I have 20 bucks? You know? And I'm like, when they're done, uh, Dad, excuse me, I thought I asked you for 20 dollars. <laughs> There's something wrong with your attitude when you're asking, right? Is there a difference? Let me ask you so I can make this point clear. Is there a difference between somebody asking you for water that just came into your house? And they're okay. They ask you for some water. Or somebody who's dying of thirst and they ask you for water. Is there a difference in the way they ask? There's a different way to ask, right? Someone who thinks if you give me water, it's nice, but if you don't give it to me, I'll be okay. Their attitude is, and if you don't give it to them, then you'll, they'll be fine, they'll forget about it too. But somebody who's dying of thirst, they will ask, and once they ask, what's happening? When they're done asking, what do they do? waiting impatiently. And when they don't see it after 10 seconds, what do they do? They ask again. Could you, could you get that? Did you forget about that water? Could you get that water again? The way in which we ask Allah for guidance is very, very telling. It's a very good indication of how desperate we are for guidance. And if the way you and I ask Allah for guidance is, If the way you ask Allah for guidance is not desperate, if the way I ask Allah for guidance is not desperate, you know what that proves to me? I don't have to prove it to anybody else. It proves to me that I am not really that desperately in need of guidance. If you send it to me, well and good. If not, I'll be, I'm doing okay. Everything's fine. The first thing that has to change is our desperation for guidance. We have to feel a desperation for guidance. This, is, this thing is so valuable, Allah doesn't just give it to whoever, he want, whoever wants it. 
You don't just casually ask for it. You have to have a certain way of asking. There's a certain way you and I have to build. And that has to happen in what institution? In Salat. In Salat, we have to stand and ask Allah for guidance in the most desperate way. That, that attitude needs to be there. It's hard. It's hard for me and it's hard for you. I'm not saying I've, I've mastered it, not even close. We're all in the same boat here. This reminder is as applicable to you as it is to me. You know, nobody's in a better position than anybody else. This is something we all personally really, really need to work on. Let's take another step now. The first thing was desperation. We have to be desperate and we, intense in how we ask for guidance. But what is guidance? An easy definition. I know I really need it. I know I should ask for it a lot. I know I can't own it. I can be given it, but it can be taken away at any moment. It's a treasure that you can't, once you earn it, you can't keep it. It can go away. So you have to keep asking for it. Muslim or not, doesn't matter. But then what is it? Essentially, guidance boils down, for you and me, practically speaking, guidance boils down to choices. That's what it boils down to. Between Doha and Asr, I'm driving back to the office. There is a billboard, I have a choice to look or not to look. There's a song playing on the radio, I have a choice to listen or not to listen. There's a friend calling back, biting about another friend. I have a choice to carry on the conversation or end the conversation. There's a fight going on between me and my in-laws. I have a choice to end the fight or keep the fight going. Keep the, keep the fuels of my anger burning. All of my life boils down to choices. Do or don't do. Look or don't look. Text or don't text. Post or don't post. Email back or don't email back. Watch the video or don't watch the video. Go to the movie or not go to the movie. It's all choices. Yes or no? And you know what? Guidance is practically right before you make any choice, you turn back to Allah and say, what's the right choice? Could you guide me? Could you guide me to the right choice? And then every choice you make and I make, we turn back to Allah and we seek His counsel and then we make a choice. That's guidance. Do choices happen just once a day? How often do we make choices? Literally every second. Every second we're making choices. When do we need guidance then? Every second. Every second we need guidance. Is it easy to forget that we need guidance? In a lecture you will be told you need guidance. In a book you will be told you will need guidance. But in life, when you're not sitting in the masjid, when you're, when you're at work, when you're hanging out with friends, when you're on campus, when you're in the car, you know, when you're at the hotel, when you're in different places, that's when it will be proven whether you seek guidance or not. The second distinction I want to make for you, the first was knowledge and guidance are two different things. Remember that? The second distinction I want to make for you is being Muslim and being guided are two different things. They're not the same thing. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided all of us to Islam. Alhamdulillah. That does not mean that we are guaranteed guidance. That means we made our first guided decision. Guidance, or, guidance boils down to what I said? It boils down to choices. Becoming a Muslim or being a Muslim is one good choice. It's not the only choice in life. It's one choice. And that good choice of becoming a Muslim opens door, the doors to all the other good choices in life. But that does not mean you'll always be making the right decisions. And I'll always be making the right decisions. Now, the two points I've made thus far is we have to be desperate for guidance and we need it all the time. And we can't own it. That's the basic points I've made with you so far. What is the relationship between this and the Qur'an? The Qur'an is basically my counselor, my advisor, my source for guidance. I recite the Qur'an and I'm not thinking, but you know, knowledge is one thing. I should understand the grammar, I should understand the language, I should understand the tafasir and all of that stuff. But at the end of it all, I'm learning all of that only for one reason. I want to make the right choices. You know what happens to people that study religion? Not just our religion, any religion. And this is true of our people too. 
When we study religion, we study fiqh, we study aqidah, we study Quran, we study tafsir, we study religion and we forget that the reason we're studying it is to make the right choices. It just becomes learning for the sake of learning. That's a, that's a major problem. The reason we are learning is to make better choices. So if you've been studying the Quran, brother or sister, and yet your relationships at home are just horrible. They're horrible. You've been studying the Quran and you're still as lazy as you were before you memorized Surah Al-Baqarah and after you memorized it. You are still as mean. You are still as impatient. You're, you're still as oblivious as you were before. Then the only difference between before and after is the difference between a parrot that memorizes certain lines and after is still a parrot. You can be a really bad person without knowing Arabic and you can still be a really bad person after knowing Arabic. Arabic doesn't make you a good person. Arabic is on the academics. Acad evil people can be academic too. <laughs> it's the other side, it's the attitudes. The attitudes that have to ch experience a change. So I want to talk now about the Qur'an's particular role as guidance. We already talked about the importance of guidance itself. But the Qur'an's role in guidance. Qur'an is supposed to be recited every single day, multiple times in our salat, so that Allah gives us a sermon, He gives us some guidance. And if you are of the Muslims that are sitting in this audience, and probably that's the case for most of you, that when you recite the Qur'an, or when the Qur'an is recited to you in prayer, you don't understand it, then you need to compensate. You need to compensate by studying the Qur'an outside of salat. The original intention in the religion, the original idea of the religion is, your relationship with the Qur'an is supposed to be maintained in, in Salat. But if that's not happening for you, and you don't understand what's happening in Salat, then you have to compensate for that until you learn better. Until you learn better, you have to become a student of the Qur'an. So now my advice to you is, what does it mean that you and I are becoming students of the Qur'an for the purpose of guidance? Students of the Qur'an for the purpose of guidance. Number one thing, priority. My teacher used to give this example to me. He used to say, if I was to pay you one dollar, give you, he hands me a shovel, and I'll pay you one dollar, dig a hole here, ten feet deep. How long would it take me to dig a hole ten feet deep? The whole day. How much is he gonna pay me? One dollar. Then he takes another student. He says, dig a hole. How, how deep? <coughs> 10 feet deep. I'll give you $50,000. Who's gonna dig faster? Is there a difference in the digging? Who's gonna take a break and who's not gonna take a break? Who's gonna say, I got no time, man, I'm busy right now. And who's gonna say, hold on, can I do this later? I got a phone call. You see, there's a difference in attitude, right? Why is there a difference? They're both doing the same job. Why is there a difference? Tell me. You get something more out of it now. You get something more out of it. If you get something more out of it, it will get your attention, it will get your time, it will get your effort. Isn't that true? The fact that you guys are cramming the night before the exam. Medical students become medical patients before the exam. You know. They study so hard. The fact that you know, you're know you an accountant, the, the, you don't even come home from night. Tax season. When you're running the store and it's Christmas break or you know Black Friday or Green Thursday, whatever it is. You gotta run the store. This is the most important time of the year. When you have the, image, the green card appointment, at 8 a.m. and you show, there, show up there at 9 p.m. the night before. It's important, it deserves your time, your attention. So it gets the time and the attention. The fact that the Qur'an does not get my time and attention, the fact that it doesn't get my time and attention, that is proof to me, I don't think that it has something to offer me. My life is fulfilled as it is. I have everything I need. I have a TV, I have a PlayStation, I have an internet connection, I have an iPhone, I have a car, I have a fridge full of food, I have a family, I have a roof over my head, I have air conditioning, I have a job. I have, I have, I have, I have, I have. So if I don't have guidance, what's the big deal? 
that's what's going on in most of our heads, you know that? The reason we're not making time for the Qur'an is we don't even see what's the big deal. What am I going to get out of it anyway that I don't already have? Everything's fine. You and I have to start seeing life differently. We will not get out of the Qur'an anything except what we put in. The Qur'an is not the reader's digest, it's not some blog that you visit once in a while and you read it casually a little bit. The Qur'an is a serious read for my own life. Our seriousness towards the Qur'an. How, how big of a priority it is. It has to change. And if you just woke up to that now, maybe you woke up to that recently, and you feel like you've been robbed of it your entire life, and now only now you get to realize what this Qur'an is. I never even knew. I never even knew. I, I, I can tell you, I felt like that the first time I truly appreciated the Qur'an with the teacher, and I realized that it is personally talking to me, it's giving me guidance. This book is a gift to me personally, for me to live a better life. When I realized that, that Allah has gifted every single believer with His personal words, when you come to that realization, there's a, there's a rattling that happens inside you. How did I not do justice to this book all this time? How come it didn't get any of my time? How come I started falling asleep every time I recited it? How come that happened to me? I have done so much wrong to this book, it deserves so much better from me. This amazing gift. You ever give a gift to somebody? Have you ever done that? You go to their house, you hand them with something gift wrapped. And they take it and say, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> what does that mean? I have no appreciation for your gift. Or you go to somebody's house and you see the same gift that you gave them gift wrapped, it's still in a corner in a shelf somewhere, it's still gift wrapped. Isn't that the thing that got you? Yeah, I was gonna open that. I was waiting for a special occasion. Sound familiar? What do we do that with? The gift Allah gave us. The Quran. That's the gift Allah gave us. That's what we do with the Quran. We don't give it time. It's gift wrapped and it's sitting there. It's in its place. And we'll only pull it out on what? Special occasions. It's only gonna come out on special occasions. What a sad tragedy. Now let's say you come and I come and we say, Ya Allah, we're gonna change our attitude. I want guidance from this Quran. I wanna learn it. I wanna fulfill its academic prerequisites, not because I wanna be an academic, not because I wanna show off my knowledge, because I wanna make the right choices in life, because I want guidance. Ya Allah, I'm coming to this book with the right attitude. You know what's gonna happen? You're gonna notice something. The Quran is a lot like a mirror. The Quran is a lot like a mirror. When you start reciting Quran, you start seeing yourself. Believers, true believers have already attained success. Oh, maybe I'm a true believer, I should read on. I don't think I'm overwhelmed in prayer. So the first time I said the true believers are the ones who are overwhelmed and they're in awe of Allah when they're making salat especially. My salat is more like cardiovascular exercise. So I don't, maybe, maybe I should cross that one out. I didn't need that prerequisite, maybe the next one. They're constantly trying to purify themselves. Yeah, that's not me. Maybe the next one. They stay away from useless conversation, useless activity. Actually, I was on Facebook right now. Maybe I should cross that out too. Man, one after the other, after the other, you start saying, I should meet some of these qualifications, shouldn't I? Because Allah says, these are the people who attained success. You don't just read that, you're supposed to see yourself in that. Where do you stand? Where do I stand? You don't just learn the grammar of it and say it's a jumla fi'liya. And aflaha is the fi'il and al mu'minuna is the fa'il. You don't just do that. You're, you and I are supposed to see where do I stand in this book? What does what my life look like? That's the difference between someone who just looks at the Qur'an for academics and someone who looks at the Qur'an for guidance in life. But now when you start seeing, do you notice there's a difference between what the Qur'an wants and when you, where you and I are in life? Do you start noticing a difference? Seems like Qur'an is going this way and we're going that way. So immediately you realize I need to make some changes in life, right? You, you realize you need to make some changes in life. Are any of us going to change overnight? But at least we should try. 
at least you and I should have a list of things that we know are wrong with us. Have you ever done that? Make a list of things that are wrong with you? I know you've made a list of things that are, that are wrong with your husband. And a list of things that are wrong with everybody else. Especially people at the masjid. But what about a list of things that are wrong with me? Just myself. I'm too lazy. I don't pay attention in salat. I don't, I, I don't ever make time to memorize the Quran. I don't call my mother enough. I don't give my dad enough respect. Make a list. What is the stuff that I need to work on? It's not rocket science. You just figure it out and you try to make those changes. Inspired by the guidance of the Quran, you try to make those changes. And you know what's gonna happen? When you try to make those changes, people around you will notice. And the first group of people that will notice are the people that are the closest to you. Who's the closest to you? Family. They will notice. Something's changed. What's happening? We were just making fun of that person and you didn't jump in. What happened? You used to have the best disses. We're waiting on a home run from you, but you didn't say anything. I don't want to do that. Why not? You used to be cool. Hey, we're going out to the concert. You coming? No. Why not? It's your favorite band. No, I don't listen to that stuff anymore. What? You don't listen to that stuff anymore? You're the one who took me to the concert last time. <laughs> what are you talking about? Let's go, man. Come on. Let's do this. No, no. no. I'm looking for guidance. You think you're better than us? Your family's got to start, to start telling you, Oh, you think you're all this shit now? <laughs> oh, your hijab is so spiritual. We're all the filthy, right? We're all mushrikun. You're the only Muslim. Sarcasm will begin inside the house. You'll start hearing all kinds of stuff. Oh, you, this one. His holiness is here, everyone. <laughs> Could you stick your hand in the water before I drink it? Because, you know, you'll become an object of ridicule. <laughs> Your friends will stop hanging out with you. Because the, the, your friends, they do stuff that's against guidance. Because once, once you develop a love for guidance, you can't hang out with them much anymore. So you start distancing yourself from your friends. <coughs> you start getting distance from family. They start, they start getting upset with you. Why aren't you going to that wedding? I can't go, you know what kind of environment that's gonna be. No, but that's your cousin. You have to go. And you will dance. These are the conversations that happen inside, behind closed doors. These are not the conversations that happen in the masjid, but they happen in your home. These are the conversations. What do you mean? You're not going to that college. No, Dad, I can't take a loan like that. You will become a doctor when you like a Yeah, but that's a loan. It's like interest-based. Isn't that like haram or something? <coughs> what do you know about? You're going to teach me a lot on haram side? Go get the loan. Go, go become a doctor. Why are you going to... Quran says, obey your parents, okay? Just obey your parents. <laughs> These are the conversations happening inside the Sikhs. Girl starts wearing hijab. Dad is, mom is worried. Mom's the first one to be worried. What's that thing on your head? Take it off. What are you doing? We don't trust like that. You, if you love me, you will take it off. Don't make me tell your dad. Then dad comes, I love you. I don't want you to be attacked. I don't want you to be looked at. I'm worried about you, take it off. Sometimes they'll say it out of anger, sometimes they'll say it out of love. Just take it off. It's okay, it's not a sin. You don't have to do it, it's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm telling you, I'm your father, I know. I'm your mother, I'm worried about you. Nobody's gonna marry you if you look like that. Just take it off. Why do you have to pray to me? You went to their house and it was Maghrib time, you have to pray, you have to show off, what you have to pray? Why do you have to do that? Mom, it's Maghrib time, I have to pray. No! You, don't, you couldn't wait until we come home. These are conversations inside Muslim homes. And why do these conversations happen? Because some of our crazy young people decide they're gonna make a little change or two in their life towards guidance. And a, a red alert goes off. It's like security alert in the family. My, my young son is becoming crazy. I get two kinds of people that come to me, parents that come to me. One, parents that say my child has wants nothing to do with Islam. Two, my child started praying, I'm a little worried about him, I think he's getting too extreme. 
Because we want our children to be Muslim, but not Muslim, Muslim, I used to say, right? Not, not that Muslim. Just like, Jum'ah Muslim is enough. <laughs> like we are. You know, the Jum'ah Muslim is enough, but the rest is, the rest is for these mullah people. Not for you guys. When you start developing a relationship with the Qur'an, you will notice something. This is a gift from Allah. And not everybody gets it. You, you, you should beg Allah, and you should beg Allah that we get it. You know what it is? you will feel cut off from everyone. And through the Qur'an, you will feel connected to Allah. You'll feel like Allah is the only one you can talk to, and Allah is the only one who really is talking to you. The words of Allah will come through the book, like Allah just revealed those words. It will happen. Nobody, you, you, you and I cannot appreciate through a talk that the Qur'an is guidance. A lecture can't do that for you, and a lecture cannot do that for me. It is when you and I recite the Qur'an seeking guidance, and then the guidance of Allah comes. When it comes and you experience it, there is no comparison. There is no comparison to that. It is a lifetime experience. That's the experience you and I need to be seeking. I know some of you have heard me talk about this on YouTube, but I want to share it with you again because it's relevant to this conversation. It's one of my favorite stories with my own children. My first daughter, Hasna, who was actually a student in class here too. Hey, first kid. I have six now, I can't even remember their names. There's too many. But when the first child is born, you know what happens, right? You pay attention to everything. Anyway, she burps so cute, even when she pukes. It's cute. She should have to kick her out like, hey, da, 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 da. <laughs> And I, I, I didn't get disgusted. I was like, oh, that's so cute. And this kid, I'm making salat at home. This kid is crawling around. And she, I can see her from the corner of my eye because, you know, even though we spread a sajada and musalla and it's a rectangle, our eyes work beyond the rectangle. It's not like all you see is the rectangle, you have peripheral vision. So from the corner of my eye, this kid is just sitting around, and all of a sudden, hands on the floor, and she's standing for the first time. And she's kind of shocked herself, she doesn't know what's going on here. And she's looking straight at me, I know it. Your first child standing up for the first time, exciting moment or no? Oh man. Oh man. And I was in Salat. And in Salat, I just did. <laughs> I almost called the wife in Salat. <laughs> but then I got myself together and I kept on praying. And now, you know, when that happens, what should you want to do? If that happens, you, you should want to finish your Salat and get to it. Just get it, get it done. So I was in the middle of reciting and I kept on reciting. Just to finish up. It happened to be I was reciting Surah so Al-Munafiqun. Allah Azza wa says in the ayah I recited next, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awlalukum ma'an dhikrillahi wa min yafa'al dhalika fa hulaika humu al-khasirun. Those of you who believe, don't let your monies and your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah and whoever does so are the ultimate losers. <laughs> So I'm standing and reciting that, and for moments I forgot that I am a child. I just forgot. And you realize Allah is watching, and Allah is giving you direct guidance to His book. Allah is talking to you, and Allah is talking to you. That's what He's doing in His book. It's, it's, there's no more beautiful a feeling. There's no more beautiful a feeling. This is the attitude we need to develop towards the Quran. Number one, an appreciation and desperation for it. Number two, a, a need to want to change ourselves. I want to change myself. I want it to, I want it to impact me. When you hear the stories of the Sahaba, it's something else. I'll share one Sahabi story with you and one an old friend story with you about how Quran changes people. You know, the mother of the believers, Aisha anha was cooking. And while cooking, she had an apron in front of her and she was cooking. 
And the Prophet ﷺ is walking and the house is not big. I mean, quarters are very, very, very small. The size of a Texas closet, really. Okay, so she's cooking and she can see from the window that the Prophet is coming And the Prophet ﷺ is reciting the ayat from Surah An-Nur that talk about covering of the women. This is the first time she's hearing these ayat. She didn't know about these ayat. Where is she outside her home? At home you have to have hijab on or no? No, but she doesn't know. All she heard is, believing women showing. She, she's listening to the ayat and she can't find a cloth. She tears off her apron and covers her head. Immediately. Sahaba are praying towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. A, a Sahabi walks by and says that he recites the ayat of the Qibla being changed. They were praying in Jama'ah, in Jama'ah, towards Aqsa. And then the Sahabi runs by and recites the ayah of the change of Qibla, and in Jama'ah they switch sides. They don't even wait to finish the prayer, they don't even say, does that apply to us right now, should we finish? We have to have a debate about this. Nothing. We heard Qur'an, it's enough, we should change. We should move it. You know how difficult it is to come across liquids in the desert, drinks in the desert, how quickly it dries up. When we think of alcohol in our industry, in our country, it flows like water. It's available in, it's in the mountains of it or in Walmart. Right? But back in Arabia, when you squeezed wine and you made hummer, it's expensive. Why? Because you don't have a lot of food to begin with. It's a, it's a commodity, it's a really expensive asset. The ayat of khamr come down, the ayat of the prohibition of alcohol come down. And Sahaba have finished drinking it, and they start gagging their mouth so they can throw it up. Not like, oh I won't do it again. Oh man, that was too soon, too close to the ayat. I should gag and throw it up, subhanAllah. The entire streets are filled. These are Sahaba stories. What about our times? I used to live in Long Island. There was a Puerto Rican fellow from the neighborhood who came to the masjid and became Muslim. And he became, he used to live with his girlfriend, had a baby with a girlfriend too, Christian guy. Came to the masjid, started learning Salat. Then one day in the middle of conversation, he was talking to the Imam and he said, yeah, my girlfriend, I'm trying to give her a salam. You know, a little hard. And the Imam says, I'm sorry, you have a girlfriend? He goes, yeah, we have a baby too. He says, I don't think you can be with her. As a Muslim, you have to get married. And he goes, what do you mean I can't be with her? That's my girl. <laughs> he doesn't know. He has no, all he knows is Islam is one God and you have to pray. He doesn't know all the rules. So as a polite gesture, the Imam opens up the Quran and shows him certain ayah. Do not come to your zina. Don't come to your zina. Don't come to your adultery and fornication. Any relationships outside of marriage. Okay. He listens to the ayah. And he leaves. He's there every morning at Fajr. Every morning. <coughs> and after about a couple of weeks, he asked one of the brothers, Do you have some space in your apartment I can rent? Or in your house, a basement or something I can rent? Because uh, I was looking. And he said, Don't you have a house right there? He goes, yeah, but ever since I heard this ayah, I've been sleeping in the backyard. But winter is starting. So I was hoping I could rent a place. SubhanAllah. Quran comes, and if you really think of it as guidance, you will change. You will change. These are not stories of old times, this is happening now. This even happens now. We have been, we are the gifted Ummah of the Quran. Bani Israel lost their book. They lost their book. The Nasara lost their book. They have pieces of their book. We have the entire book. And the entire explanation of the book by the Prophet himself in his practice of Allah. What more can we ask for? The only thing missing from this picture is you and me. That's the only thing missing. Get ready for Ramadan. Start making time for the Quran from now. Start memorizing a little bit of it every day. Start listening to some tafsir of the Qur'an, some explanation of the Qur'an. And I recommend listening over reading because in reading you get sleepy. In listening you're stuck in the car anyway. So listen to tafsir. 
listen to Quran explanation, especially explanation of surahs you've already memorized. And every time you listen and learn something, you, even if you don't take notes, even if you don't memorize everything that was said, at the end of it all, ask Allah to make that a means of guidance. Because that's the bottom line, that's why we're doing all of this. There's no other reason to do this. There's no other reason. Those of you that studied Arabic these 10 days, may Allah Azza wa Jal make, make, make it count as ibadah for you and me. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make it count towards us fixing our attitudes towards the Quran, really taking it as counsel, really taking it as guidance. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless you, me, and our families to make the right choices in life. Make the right choices based on the guidance that Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed. May Allah Azza wa Jal put in all of us a love of the Quran. And may Allah put in us a feeling that a day goes by without reciting Qur'an, we should feel like we're missing a family member. Like you miss your child, you haven't seen them all day. You miss a loved one, you, you, you haven't seen them. We should feel a loss of the Qur'an like that. I miss the Qur'an. I need to go and pick it up and read it. This Qur'an should become my companion, my best friend. You know, my associate, my, my helper in troubled times. The only one I can talk to sometimes. That's what this should be. When nobody else understands you, Allah understands you. That's what this Qur'an should become for all of us. May Allah Azza wa Jal gift us with that beautiful relationship with His book. And may Allah Azza wa Jal reward us more and more and more and make our studies of the Qur'an and our learning of the Qur'an and our application of the Qur'an easier and easier and easier for us only because we want His guidance. The last bit and I'll leave you, inshaAllah ta'ala. What is the most repeated quality of the Qur'an mentioned in the Qur'an? Do you know? Other than guidance. Not mercy, no. Other than guidance, what's the most repeated quality of the Quran mentioned? Zikr. You're right. Reminder and remembrance. I told you in the beginning of this talk, when somebody needs guidance, when somebody needs directions, they don't need them over and over again, huh? But the Quran's guidance, you need it what? Over and over and over again. Never sit in the dust. Never sit in a khutbah, never sit and listen to an ayah of Qur'an and say, Oh, I already know this. I already got this. Because it's not being given to you for knowledge, it's being given to you for remembrance, reminder. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَةِ الذِّكْرَى Remind, reminder has benefit. ذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنَ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٌ Remind with the Qur'an, whoever fears my promise, my threat. The Qur'an should be remembered over and over and over again. None of us should feel, I already know this one. I already studied that surah. I don't need to recite it again. The Qur'an should be recited constantly. Constantly. It, you'll notice it'll start purifying your life. It'll start purifying your family life. It'll start purifying your home. The home in which the Qur'an is being recited, not by an MP3 player, but by the souls that live in that house, that house will be free of a lot of problems. Then that house will enjoy a lot of barakah. Quran should be recited by you, the wife, the children, the parents, and it should be recited in the house. It should be recited. How many homes have fights and arguments? You know fights and arguments, you can't say that shaitan doesn't have anything to do with them. Shaitan has something to do with them. What does shaitan hate? He hates the guidance. He runs when the Quran is recited. Ista'id billahi min shaitan al rajim Seek Allah's protection from the shaitan and recite the Qur'an. You will remove a lot of fitna from your house. It will bring a lot of blessings to your house. And once we fulfill these primary obligations of the Qur'an, of changing ourselves and seeking its guidance, then you know what? Use it for the ceremony. Keep it in the dashboard of your car. Recite it to feel better, to get healthier. Use it for reciting, but to get more barakah. All of that's great. But that's secondary. The Qur'an, the correct attitude towards this book is primary. So I beg Allah Azza wa Jal for myself and for all of you and especially for our children that Allah make us a people of the Qur'an كما قال الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أهل القرآن I leave you with this hadith by one of my favorite hadith about the Qur'an the Prophet صلى الله addressed the Ummah and he said يا أهل القرآن people of Qur'an لا تتوسل القرآن don't turn the Qur'an into a pillow don't relax on the Qur'an don't become lax and lazy about the Qur'an وَتْلُوهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ مِنْ أَنَاءِ اللَّيْلِ وَالْنَهَارِ Read it and follow it like it deserves to be read and followed in all hours of the night and day. Wafshuhu, spread it. Wataqannawhu, and beautify it. Beautify it with your voices. Enjoy reciting Quran. Even if you're tone deaf, even if nobody else likes your recitation, you should enjoy reciting. It's for you. Watadabbaru fihi, and 
deeply reflect into the book. So that all of you may become successful. Allahumma ja'alna min al-muflihin. May Allah make us all be successful. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iya'kum bil ayati wa lakum al-Hakim. I don't think there's a need for questions and answers, really. Now, nothing I said means a question. Really, I didn't talk about any complicated, like, 8 Taraweeh versus 20 Taraweeh. Or home financing. I didn't. So, yeah.